Hello and welcome to this recorded reading of Alfred McGlinchey's new book, Tied to the Wind. My name is Louise and I work here at Inland West Cork Art Centre. Alfred McGlinchey, who is based in West Cork, was our first poet in residence at Illin in 2015. During her time with us, she facilitated a popular series of workshops for adults, teens and children and produced a pamphlet of the children's poems. Her collections, The Lucky Star of Hidden Things and Ghost of the Fisher Cat, were published by Salmon Poetry. Both books were translated into Italian. In 2019, a chapbook titled Invisible Insane was published by Survision. Her work has also been translated into Spanish, Irish, Polish and Romanian. Afric has received a number of awards, including a Hennessy Poetry Award, Northern Liberties Poetry Prize, Poets Meet Politics Prize, a Faber Academy Fellowship and an Arts Council COVID-19 bursary to write poems that describe the global impact of the pandemic. She was also awarded an Arts Council Literature Bursary to write Tied to the Wind, which we are launching today. Tied to the Wind is an auto-fictional narrative where the Irish-born protagonist finds her family moving to various locations between Ireland and Africa, following several changes in family fortunes. The book doesn't pretend to pre present a cohesive picture of her nomadic upbringing. Context is slowly drip-fed through fragments. But these implicit impressions reveal other complexities faced by the narrator who, like her siblings, is both privileged and neglected. As a narrator, she swerves from being infuriatingly helpless to melodramatic to sympathetic. This is a story about a half-innocent girl trying to understand something of the world she inhabits. The book has received glowing endorsements from acclaimed authors such as Sarah Baum, William Wall, Mia Gallagher, Conal Creedon, Paul McMahon, Grace Wells and Paul Perry. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Afric McGlinchey. Hi everyone, thank you so much for turning up to listen to my reading. And thank you to Illin um, Art Centre of West Cork for hosting this event, in particular Justine, Louise and Stephen, who's doing the technical side. And um, mostly thank you to Aaron Kent of Broken Sleep Books, who has taken a leap and published my book. The first piece I'm going to read for you is set in Zambia, um, in Ndola, and I'm about seven or eight years of age. This piece is called Subliminal Bat Squeak. Black has invited the three of us to his house for lunch. We skirt the swimming pool, carefully avoiding the ten foot long pole topped by a leaf net, and go through the little gate at the back of our courtyard. I'm curious to see inside his kaya and to meet his wife. Pungent with wood smoke, it's dark in his thatched rondavel. One tiny window with a green cloth hanging over it, and the same kind of fabric hanging from the open door. Four milky green enamel plates, a gas canister, a few limp clothes by the wall. There are only three worn smooth batonka stools. Black sits on one, Iva takes a second. I glance up at a Mai Halawa. Black nods to me. It's okay, she'll sit later. Molly sits cross-legged on the smooth, polished mud floor and pushes her blonde, sticky hair from her forehead. There's no table. I fan myself with my library book, The Castle of Adventure. A Mai Halawa thrusts an enamel plate with a chipped rim at me. Not covered in a duck, her hair flops like wilted pea pods from the top of her head. I've never seen her this close up before. Her skin is black as treacle, and she has a way of looking at me that makes me feel as though little snakes are climbing up and down my spine. She's wearing a, tie, a dirty housecoat with a sarong wrapped around it, the same patterned green as the curtain hanging in the doorway, which casts an underwater gloom into the room. She is silent, but a storm cloud whirls around her like the smoke from the poiki pot. Black tells us about growing up in Malawi, 
a country north of Zambia. The turquoise lake with multicoloured fish, the beaches, fishing with his father in his boat. Why did you leave and come here, I ask? His wife clicks her tongue against the roof of her mouth. He shouts at her in Bemba, then immediately apologises to us. The fried fish is burnt. The Nshima is lumpy and grey, like badly cooked porridge. I can't eat it, even though I know it's rude not to. The spinach with peanut butter I can manage. Mmm, I look up and smile at her. It's delicious. Tikoma am I? I've learned people-pleasing skills from Enid Blyton, which sometimes means knowing when to lie. Amai speaks to Black in Bemba, scrapes her food back into the pot, and, swaying her bottom and slapping her flip-flops across the floor, walks out of the room. So this next piece is also set in Zambia, and my parents have gone to Ireland uh, because my mother's sister is very ill, and she's left me on a farm with a friend of mine, and my brother and sister are elsewhere. So this is called Dissolving. Moth wings and dead flies line the cinder windowsill. It's been weeks and weeks of soggy Weetabix, and the kitchen is always stiff with the smell of onions and boiling milk. And I'm forgetting my mum's face, even though I still hear her voice in my dreams. And I'm wondering if my little sister will remember me. And Marie and I hide under blankets from twirling, trembling thunderstorms. And sometimes I wander from room to foreign room, looking for something familiar. And I wish I could talk to my brother. Are they all okay? Without my family, I'm a sentence with most of the words missing. And my memory of our house is slipping and sliding like an egg off a plate. And every night, even when I pull the darkness over my head, my Heidi crying sounds pool around my bed, leaking towards Marie's bed on the other side of the room. And my heart is an ache on a loop, and I'm scared of even thinking the thought, will I ever see my family again? So now um, I'm about eight and my family are moving from Lusaka to a place in the bush where my father is going to be training the Zambian army. Um, so I had been told the place was called Broken Hill. This is called A Place Snaps Its Bowels Against the Wind. Broken Hill. Broken Hill is a good name for a place where they do mining. It rushes a picture into my head of rocks tumbling and cracking at the bottom of a quarry, making a copper fracture. But one of the officers says this town's new name is Cabwe. Why did mum and dad tell me its old name? Now I have to change the taste of the place in my mouth, the sound of it, the energy, and it makes me feel twisty, like pitching head over tail or rolling into a surprise cartwheel. To say Cabwe, jostles me out of copper, into brown muddiness. I have to invent the place all over again, and myself in it. So now I'm coming up to 10 years of age and we have suddenly moved back to Ireland with no notice. And uh, yeah, it's raining, it's cold, it's February. And this is in Limerick. This is called The Feathery Rain and the Bus and the Hiss. The red bus, with its full decks of passengers, trembles and steams. Sitting in the clammy ribcage of the upper deck, I make a circle in the window. Birds baffling about, brown or black or grey or several combinations. My eyes blur as horses in a field make this bleak world beautiful. If only I haven't behaved like a coward instead of getting back up in the saddle. If only we hadn't galloped 5,000 miles away from black, my friends, the sunshine, Christmas beetles, crickets and grasshoppers from the singing sky. The bush with its elephant grass growing up to seven feet. Those velvety nose days that dipped scent into our hands. That pummeling rain like a thousand hands clapping on a thousand knees. The jasmine, pomegranates, 
dung beetles, the sunbirds and lilac-breasted rollers. Instead, this clambering damp as the door hisses open. This is a couple of years later and I am coming up to 12 years of age. Um, and we're still in Limerick. This is called Hands and Whispers. We walk two by two from Laurel Hill to St. Joseph's. Up the steps we go, a line of girls like soldier ants for confession. Most of us have already turned 12, ready to be soldiers for God. The hands of pedestrians making a full stop on forehead, sternum, left collarbone, right collarbone, as they pass the church. I don't hug my arms, don't want to let the cold goad me. Even inside the cathedral, the chill remains like water in a slow draining bath. Into the box. After my usual litany of lies, disobediences, the priest clears his throat, like a car whose ignition is failing to kick in the engine. <clears throat> do you ever have dirty thoughts? What do you mean dirty? Do you think about naked bodies? Do you ever touch yourself, you know, your private parts? Something feels sharp and jagged inside me. No! Body surges of heat. What is he talking about? My mother has always taught me to use a flannel when washing down there, never to touch with my bare hands. Gross! That's where you pee and what not. I jolt out of the cubicle, shuddering, as though I've just been attacked by a squad of hot fleas in the gulping dark. So this is still in Limerick and uh, it's called Strike Against the Leviathan. Because I still crave his favour despite everything, clutching to his approval like a hot water bottle, it's a long time before I challenge my father. It finally happens as he is heading down the corridor towards the bathroom and hears us awake. I am reading to my sister and have just hopped out of bed to switch off the light, then jumped onto my bed when he storms in, his shadow projected on the empty wall, huge as a grand piano. I gauge him at the fifth of his seven stages, eyes red rimmed and leaky, the growly words slithering out like a leaky pen blobbing onto a page. What are you doing, sir? As he takes two staggery steps, reaches me, lifts my nighty, and wallops me on the bum. I have my period, the third, and there's the bulgy ST, sticky with blood and that iron smell. I am both humiliated and enraged all the way to my outer edge, primarily because it means I will now have to inform my little sister about the facts of life. She is staring, horror stricken at the bulge in my knickers. On the other hand, any other time of the month, I would have been bare under my nighty, which would have been worse. Standing on the bed, I am taller than my father, eyeballing him. You will never, and I pause to make sure he is paying attention, lay a hand on me again, on any of us. So we're on our way to a farm uh, southeast of Ferrari and we've stopped at a village store. This is called So Far. The Chop Chop Shop, Wedza. A tailor straddles a stool in front of an old singer with some Java print, feeding the green, yellow, orange pattern material past a whirring needle. From within the dim interior, a cascade of coins onto the concrete counter. Dad getting rid of small change. An overhead sign, best hot chips in town, only $4 a bag. Someone thumps a crate onto the wooden floor of the store. The metal burglar bars catch a ray of sunlight. A quick twisty chongololo skitters on the red dirt, shuddering slightly over corrugations. An eruption of laughter from two guys leaning against wafer thin walls, froth smearing their upper lips. The tailor is treadling with a lever at his feet. A nervy spider weaving a handkerchief web between bars. Because it's always mid-project, I could never kill a spider. Someone is squatting against a tree in the shadows. Plinkety-plink. 
iron grey tufts of cotton ball hair, a madara. His fingers are wrapped around a tiny musical instrument, lines on his face as deep as cuts. I open the car door wide and swing my feet onto the dirt ground to listen to the twanging melodic sound. Molly has picked up a stone and is drawing a house in the dirt. So far, says the Madara, we have a family. He looks over at me. The father directs traffic through his legs of steel. His tongue is a current. His sight is hooded. I get out of the car and walk over to the tree, standing a few feet from him. The mother walks lightly and swiftly, lit with the gift of the sun. The Madara plucks his instrument. The girl has stories rising like wings. He plucks again. The boy, he says, looking at Ivor, who has got out of the car too and is kicking stones in the dirt, travels his anger into a power. The Mwana balances a house of dreams on her head. More notes. So far they have come. And I suddenly realise he's talking about us. When Dad comes out of the store, I beg him for coins to drop into the storyteller's custard enamel saucer. Uh, so for my last piece, I'm going to read one where I am living in Zimbabwe, but I'm very homesick and my parents decide to send me home for the holidays. So I go back alone for the summer to Donegal, where my family, my dad's family come from. This is called Chasers, Letterkenny Summer. Uncle Brennan nods Freya and me into his venue, though we're underage. Inside, we meet up with her older sister Grace, our cousin Rory, and two of his friends, Liam and Richard. The music is bright strokes of colour, dancing reds and yellows, blues and greens. And the northerners, arrived by busload, wear out the dance floor with the boys are back in town, the drinking, the joyousness, then standing still, hand to heart for the anthem. The mobile chipper outside in the car park, cheerfully mobbed at 2 a.m. Afterwards, Rory's suggestion. How about we all go to the island? And he hot wires a pickup and off we go, away from the lights of Letterkenny, out past the cemetery. Everyone except me is scuttered, six up front, two in the open back. The road flanked by the rugged Errigal slopes. Once past the valleys, we spy turf piled at the roadside skid to a halt, tumble in clod after clod until we spot the furious farmer and his sons giving chase. Congested hysterics, I feel wicked like a grave robber. For 20 long miles, the farmer's lights in the rear view until at last he veers off. We breathe at the water song of the open sea, the island a bone bulging from the water's skin, a boat waiting. In my uncle's cottage, a freezer filled with loaves, cottage digestives, tin sardines, Barry's tea, brown sugar, powdered milk. Freya, Grace and I get busy dropping frozen slices into the toaster. Rory squats at the fireplace under the, until the turf fire crackles. We pull up, guilty and warm. Liam unscrews a half jack. Richard puts on horse slips. I try to chase trouble, but it's chasing me. I begin to pick at one of the moons of candle wax left on the table from a previous visit. In the reflection of the uncurtained window, I see my lumberjack shirt, rolled up jeans. It's like watching someone else, some tomboy who takes off with dangerous lads. Rory finds a pack of cards, shuffles, deals. Liam taps out a cigarette. Freya takes a slug passes the half-jack to Grace. Smoke barrels around the small room. Alcohol fumes topple towards me like an upended chair. Think I'll go outside for a bit, I say. The climbing drizzle, how soft. Lit cottages on the nearby island. Below the tussocky shelf, white sand slopes steeply to the black water. From behind, hands clasp my waist. 
we go tumbling down the small incline. Thank you so much everyone for listening and just to remind you that the book is available at Broken Sleep Books and I really hope you support both them and me. <laughs> and one day soon I'm hoping we'll have a big party and if you buy the book I'll bring it along and I'll definitely sign it for you and we'll have loads of wine. Thank you. Thank you Afric for that beautiful reading and to everyone for joining us. You can buy the book using the link in the description below and we will have some copies available at reception here at Hillen. Afric's reading will remain on our YouTube channel so please feel free to share the link with anyone who might be interested.